sweet to trust in Jesus just to take him at his word just to rest upon his promise just to know the say the Lord is my verse I'm so glad I learned to trust him do I have any witnesses precious Jesus Savior friend and I know that thou art with me will be with me till the end say Jesus Jesus how I trust him how I pray him all and all what's his name Jesus Jesus Jesus, Jesus, with all grace to trust Him more. Come on, just look at somebody, tell them I see Jesus in you, and the Jesus in me loves the Jesus in you. Come on, clap those hands for Jesus, if you will, as you take your seat in the presence of God. Well, let me thank profusely and profoundly the angel of this house, the apostle not only of this house, but of this region and state. And God doesn't just give a local anointing, he gives a global anointing. And you have a global leader has been set in your midst. Come on, bless God for the Apostle Reginald White. Bless you, sir. Bless you. Bless you. Bless you. And to the woman of God, Pastor Emma, how we bless God for you. Thank you, Pastor. We bless you in Jesus' name. With friends like Dion Clark, I want to thank God profusely and profoundly for our friendship and brotherhood. Thank God for his ministry that has impacted my life. And I thank God. I, I, I know there's a difference now between covenant friends and covetous friends. And you don't learn that until you've been hurt one or two times. Somebody ought to help me. You don't learn that until you've been hurt one or few times by covetous friends. But God has knitted us together, and I'm thankful and grateful. Come on, give God praise for Pastor Clark. And to all of you who have assembled here, and for folk who are looking at me wondering, who is he? And can he preach? And I'm looking right back at you wondering, can you pray? I'm no stranger to the body of Christ. And it just so happens I'm a member of the Amy Zion Church, but I'm a kingdom-minded individual. I'm Baptist because I've been baptized. I've been dipped. I'm apostolic because I do believe in the apostolic doctrine. I believe that I'm Presbyterian because I've been laid on hands by the Presbytery. I'm holiness for without holiness, no one shall see God. I'm, I'm all of it, so come on. Come on, look at me with that tone of voice. Come on, get with me as we come together in the word of God. I want to thank God. I won't hold you long. Please just go with me to the gospel according to St. John. John's gospel chapter number six. I want to read the verses that are before us, verses one through 12 I think it is and I want to read those verses as we get to the word of God John's gospel chapter 6 when you found it say amen reading it from the New King James Version these words are recorded after these things Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee which is the Sea of Tiberias and then a great multitude followed him because they saw his signs 
which he performed on those who were diseased. And Jesus went up on the mountain and there he sat with his disciples. Now the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was near. Then Jesus lifted up his eyes and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? But this he said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may have a little. And one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish. But what are they among so many? Then, somebody say then. Jesus said, make the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down in number about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples, and the disciples to those sitting down, and likewise of the fish as much as they wanted. So when they were filled, he said to his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. Go back to verse 5. He said to Philip, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? But this he said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. People of God said amen. I want to talk tonight from this thought. He's more than enough. If you're close to somebody you came with, come on, tell them he's more than enough. Come on, somebody say he's more than enough. Would you bow your heads with me? God, help me. Amen. He's more than enough. He's more than enough. That's a declaration worthy of celebration. He's more than enough. It's a truism that is packed with theology, soaked with Christology, the answer to soteriology, the witness of ecclesiology, the message to anthropology, the lesson for sociology, the music of angelology, the warning to demonology, and the baseline of eschatology. He's more than enough. That's God's answer for your pain, God's response to your past, God's lesson for your present, and God's word for your potential. He's more. Are you with me? Then enough. If I, if I pronounced the benediction and took my leave of you on tonight, it would be enough for you to live on for the rest of your life. He's more than enough. These are dangerous yet liberating words. You have to be real making statements like these. You've got to be upfront, honest, and discover after all the masks you had to wear, all the fronts you had to put up, all the hoops you had to jump, all the people you had to please, all the folk you had to mess over, all the folk who messed over you, all the money you had to spend, the liquor you had to drink, the weed you had to smoke, the drugs you had to take, after all the hell you and I have been through, especially in this year alone, you're able to declare that he is more than enough. This, beloved, is the fundamental truth of the word of God. It's the, it's the fundamental message of the Holy Writ. It is the baseline of the sacred text. And it's also the dilemma that we face as people of God. There is a dysfunction that haunts the people of God, especially in this generation. And the reason why we are discomforted and dysfunctional is because we get obsessed with things, people, wealth, relationships, institutions, affiliations, and religion that when these things fail us, we are devastated. The reason why we are faced with what we're faced with and the reason why we feel the way we feel after we've come through and are coming through 
through what has been a hellacious and horrific habitat is because we've been obsessed with seasons and God wants to remind somebody that you can never get obsessed with seasons because seasons change. The great deception that is running loose in the world and in the church is that we are obsessed with ourselves to the extent that we say that God is enough. But with our lives, we say something different. And might I add the argument apostle for this message tonight, and here it is. When God is not enough, everything else is too much. I'm going to try this side over here. When God is not enough, everything else is too much. Okay, I'll try over here. When God is not enough, then everything else is too much. And I need somebody in here tonight to go on and be upfront and honest. I put my trust in things and in people and in religion. And now I've come up bereft and empty. And now I've come to a place as I look back over my life and I can truly declare that when I thought that I had to please them God shift my focus and reminded me that he is more than enough it is here then in the gospel of John that we get this evidence that beyond the religiosity of the Jewish faith there was a need for something greater than a set of laws and prescriptions in other words God had to jump over rules and regulations and give us a tangible expression of God's presence in the world don't look at me funny God had to jump over what humankind had established in order to remind us that God is not bound by earthbound regulations and strictures and structures and he jumped over and walked down 40 and two generations and John says in Arche and Hologos, Kai Hologos Postone Theon, Kai Hologos and Theos, that ain't Glossomeria that's Greek, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God, all things were made by him and without him there was nothing made that was made Amen. and the word became flesh and jumped among us because in order for God to get past and get through the structures and scriptures that we put up God had to wrap himself in socks he, he wrapped himself in flesh and, and Logos began to speak Rhema because whenever Logos shows up you can't help but have Rhema I wish I had a witness in here tonight that can testify it's one thing to have the Logos but when Logos starts speaking Logos becomes Rhema it, okay okay you're looking at me funny it, it's good to hear that by his stripes I'm healed but when you've been sick as a dog and tested positive and God brought you out of sickness and brought you to this place tonight, Logos became Rhema. Okay, you looking at me funny still? It's one thing to hear Logos. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. But when you had Negroes assassinate your character and folk lie on you and talk behind your back and talk in front of your face, but you still came in God's house and declared I will bless the Lord at all that ain't Logos that's Rhema is there anybody here who can testify I'm not here because I got something in my head I got something in my heart that through many dangers toils and snares I made it here because God's word kept me and in the gospel of John, you see it right there in John's gospel. Can I prove it to you? When the wine ran out at the wedding reception, Jesus was more than enough to take water and make it, make it wine and keep the party crunk. When the Jewish ruler Nicodemus came to Jesus at night, he understood there was something different about Jesus. Jesus told Nick that you ain't got to be religious when you can have a relationship. He says you must be born again. Can I push it again? When the Samaritan woman named Stella went to the well at an unusual hour, 
Israel, she discovered that having religion was not enough and that the five husbands and her living boyfriend was not enough and she couldn't shout and shout at the same time. She discovered that Jesus didn't want something from her. He wanted something for her. She left her water pot, y'all, went down 421 telling folk, come see a man who didn't give me my groove back, but he gave me glory in place of my grief because he's more than enough. When the man at the pool of Bethesda met Jesus, he realized that while he was reading for a bubbling, boobling, bubonic book, the Lord put a stirring in his soul and told him, rise, take up your bed and walk. And Jesus began to speak to that which was not until that which was not became what was. I saw a blood man walking down Macintosh and he told me to tell you that he's more than enough. But now we come to the gospel of John chapter number six. And here we have Jesus with two groups of people, apostle. Jesus is there with two groups of people. He, he's there with two groups of people. Somebody say two groups. Beyond there are two groups of people. There's Christ, there's crowd, there's call. Try it again. There's Christ, there's called, there's crowd. Herein lies the tension. Jesus knows that he can't get much out of a crowd. But he also knows that the called have limitations. But he takes his chances with those who have limitations because he knows he can't get much out of a crowd. Now somebody didn't shout because you've been all of that in a bag of chips and dip. But I cannot find two or three folk in here that say, Pastor, I got some limitations. I, I may have a backward collar on. I have a title in front of my name. I've got more degrees in a thermometer, but I got some limitations. And the more limitations I have, the more God continues to call me. Because God does not call the qualified, but come on, help me, somebody. He will qualify the called. And do I have any qualified folk in here who know you've been through hell and high water, but you're in here tonight as a witness? that God can take your limitations and still get the glory out of your life. Christ called crowd. Whenever Christ shows up, there's going to be tension. There's going to be tension. Called folk, crowd. There's going to always be crowd folk and called folk. Call folk know that they don't know, but know the one who does know what they don't know. But crowds know they don't know and don't want to know. There's a difference, y'all, between crowds, help me, Holy Ghost, and call. Crowds will swell, but call folk will grow. There is a difference, you know that, don't you? Crowds will show up when their name is on the marquee. But call folk don't need an invitation. They don't need the pastor calling them. They don't need engraved spaces. They don't need a special parking space. They don't need a shout out from anybody. They're just glad that one day when I was lost, he came and found me. Do I have anybody in here that just glad you saved? You don't care about having a title. It doesn't matter if you're deacon, bishop, elder, archbishop, archdeacon. It doesn't matter what your title is because your title is never greater than your testimony. As I look back over my life and I think things over, I can truly say that I've been blessed. I've got a testimony. Crowd call Christ. But watch it. He doesn't look at the crowd and ask them to produce. Because crowds don't produce. Proud crowds consume. Can I talk to the side over here? He doesn't ask the crowd to produce. Because crowds 
crowds consumed. And the reason why some leaders tonight are sitting around scratching your head, you're wigging your weed, is because you've been asking for crowds to produce. And all they do is consume what other folk work can produce. Somebody ought to help me up in here. Ah, and you're sitting there mad because you expected productivity. And all you got was self-consumed and self-absorbed Negroes that all they can do is suck up what they can get from you. They can't provide anything. They can't contribute anything. And if you're not entertaining them, they'll go to somewhere else and get entertainment because there's a difference between being entertained and being changed and transformed. And ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, you're not here to entertain. You're not here to impress. You've been called to impact. And impact will cost you everything that's in you. Somebody shout impact. Uh, somebody help me, help me, help me. Come on, ask somebody, are you here to impress anybody? Uh, you're not here to impress me, and I ain't here to impress you. I've come to make a deposit in this house that the next season of your life, help me, Holy Ghost, it's going to be a season of impact. You ain't got to sit around trying to impress anybody with how good you look and how well you sound and how wonderful you are. This is a season of impact. So whatever comes out of your mouth ought to be impact. Somebody shout impact. Anybody ready to win up in this house tonight? Come on, somebody shout impact. Listen. Y'all sit down. I'm Methodist. Sit down. Jesus knew he couldn't get much out of the crowd, but he also knew that the call would be tested. Because whenever you hang out with Jesus, he will put you in challenging positions and challenging predicaments. And too many people want to be promoted without pressure. Too many folk want to be promoted, but it doesn't cost you anything. And if you're going to stress, stretch in this hour, you can't go around stressing out. If you're going to stretch, go on and stretch. But this is not the season for you to stress. Because when God calls you, he's going to stretch you whether you like it or not. Watch what he says to Philip. Where are we going to buy bread? Hmm. Ask, look at what he asked. Where shall we buy, buy bread? He already knows they have no resources. He already knows that they come with limitations. <laughs> come on, look at your neighbor and look at them up and down. Don't start nothing in the house tonight, but look at them up and down. You're looking at a limited individual. Don't you let them fool you with their shout. Don't you let them fool you with their dress. Every last one of us come with limitations. But I like verse 8. It said, verse 6 says, he said it to test him because he already knew what they didn't have but he was not limited by their limitations preach Mitchell I think I will he was not limited by their limitations somebody help me in here the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof the world and they that dwell therein God is not limited by your limitations and Jesus said this to test him to prove him for he already knew what he was going to do. Uh, and that simply means this. God's going to do it whether you can do it or not. There's some things you cannot do. But if you just remember that you're not going to have to rely on religiosity to get through this season. Too many folk want to be religious, but no, it's about relationship, baby. It ain't about religion. It's about relationship. And watch it, y'all. Because he sets the scenario up for them because he's trying to teach a lesson to you and I. Watch it, watch it. They go about, they look around, they scrounge around, and they find, watch this, a boy with a lunch. 
comprised of five loaves and two fish. They snatch it. I wish I had time to work that. They snatch it from him. And they bring it to Jesus. And watch it. They don't talk about the boy. They talk about the lunch. And they talk about the quantity of it. Because they see quantity. But when Jesus sees it, he sees quality. I'm going to try to decide. They see, watch it, quantity. And because they're watching quantitatively, they cannot see the qualitative dimension that God is manifesting in the midst of a scarce environment. They are looking at what they have over and against what they are faced with, and they look at it and say, this is not enough. They, they say, we, we've got five, one, two, three, four, five loaves. <laughs> Two fish, all these people. Because whenever Jesus shows up, there's gonna always be a need. There will always be, and Jesus has a reputation for never letting a person come away empty. Uh, and although they did not want to feed the crowd, Jesus says, I've got my name on the line. And, and while you may have limitations and your resources may be scarce, because I've got a reputation to uphold, I'm not going to let you stop me from moving in the midst of something that you've already pronounced death over. I wish I had help in here. There's somebody in this house tonight, you're looking at your two small fish, your five barley loaves, and you're saying this ain't enough, and you're saying essentially I'm not enough but God sent me to tell you that although you may not see quality when God made you he saw quality come on somebody ought to help me in here and look at yourself no don't look at your neighbor and I dare you to say to yourself quality that God is not looking for quantity he's looking for quality if he were looking for quantity he'd have used some other folk besides you and I but aren't you glad tonight can you give God praise that beyond quantity God sees quality watch it five bread five barley loaves two fish Jesus said all right sit them down there was grass which means you couldn't see everybody that was there but, but watch it he says make them sit down make them sit down it was more than five thousand but he said make them sit down Sit them down because now it's time for me to work. Can I work the text tonight? That, that, that when, when he sits them down, that means God's getting ready to stand up. That every now and then, God will have you sit out. And whenever you start sitting down, God will stand up. The reason why there's so much depression and so much burnout and so much discouragement is because we're standing where God is standing. But I dare somebody to just sit down, tell somebody, oh, come on, I tell you what, everybody stand up. Now sit down. What you just did was gave God authority to stand up. That when you sit down, the Lord said to his servants, sit at my right hand while I make your enemies your. Somebody say, sit down. He sits them down. And, and watch it. When he sits them down, Jesus does something the disciples didn't do. And, and it blessed me. Watch it. Verse 11 says, Jesus did something with the bread that the disciples didn't do. He took the bread. You missed it. Pastor, they missed it. He took the bread. Okay. He took it. They were analyzing it. But he took it. You missed it. They were looking at it and saying, this is five barley loaves and two fish. But when he saw it, he just simply took it.
Do you know the difference between the crowd and the called? Is that the called are looking to take. But I'm not sorry. The crowd is looking to take. But the called have been took. Okay, you missed it. The crowd is looking to grab. But the call has been taken. When you allow God to take your life and place it in his hands, he does something more with it than you could do when it was in your hands. Watch it. When it was in their hands, it was, it was five barley loaves. It was two fish. Can I teach tonight? Five barley loaves and two fish until he took it. But he does something else with it. Because not only does he take it, but the Bible says he gives thanks. Okay, you missed it. He looks at it, he takes it, and he thanks God for it. <laughs> I'm having fun all by myself. He doesn't look at it and complain about it. He doesn't look at it and analyzes it. But he looks at it and he gives thanks for it. When was the last time you took what was in your hands and thanked God for it? The reason why it's small, perhaps it's because you've been complaining when you should be thanking. Do I have anybody here that can say, it's small in my hands, but I'm going to thank God for what's in my hands. I'm not going to sit there and complain about how small it is. The Bible says that he gave thanks. And when he gave thanks, something happened between giving thanks and distribution. That means God changed the molecularity of the bread and fish. And what was a sandwich for a boy's lunch became a smuggler's boy for a 10,000 crowd because God says, when you thank me for it, I'll multiply it. I'll say it again. When you thank me for it, I'll multiply it. I'll say it again. When you thank me for it, I'll multiply it. I'll say it again. When you thank me for it, I'll multiply it. If you don't thank me for it, it'll stay small. But I dare somebody to say thank you for my gift. Thank you for my life. Thank you for my ministry. Thank you for my calling. Thank you for my house. Thank you for my job. Thank you for my car. Look at somebody say, be thankful. And now, let the weak say I'm strong. Let the poor say I'm rich. Because of what the Lord has done. Come on, throw your head back. And tell God, thank you. I thank him for every step. I thank him for every stop. I thank him for every trial. I thank him for every blessing. I thank him for my ministry. Thank Thank him for my pastor. Come on, throw that head back and say thank you. I, I tell you, I tell you, I tell you. Come on, look at your life and say thank you. Look back over your life and say thank you. Look at your life and tell God thank you. You know you shouldn't be here tonight. You know you shouldn't be in this place tonight. But look at somebody and tell them I'm thankful. He thanked God for it. Sit down, I'm Methodist. Sit down. He thanked God for it. And it multiplied as he gave thanks. And he entrusted what he gave thanks for to his disciples. And watch it. And he tells them something that made me mad, Apostle because he says feed them first that made me mad that made me mad because I if I've been working and if I've been with you why I can't get mine first I've been with you longer than the crowd they gonna switch out on you they gonna switch up on you they're going to flip the script. But he says, feed them first. 
I, I know this doesn't happen in gospel light, but there have been some churches I've pastored where if you really want to see whether or not a person's really saved, put them in the kitchen. Isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing how folk who can't cook and won't cook want to be the boss over somebody else's food? I know it doesn't happen here, but I know y'all have been to some places where it has happened. The, the stingiest, meanest folk in the world want to be ushers and kitchen workers. And, and look what they do. They, they'll, they'll give you the corner. They, they give you as, as long as they can. And I found out why. Because they take the best, put it up, until the dinner's over. And, and then watch it. And they take it home saying, baby, we're going to eat good tonight and this week. But Jesus says, feed them first. And they have better sense. But to take what Jesus had given to feed the folk who showed up because what we've come to discover what I've discovered in this season of the church's history is that we become so self-absorbed that we want ours off the top and servanthood is not about what you get first it's about your capacity to give even when you don't know if there's going to be anything left uh, I like these disciples y'all because these disciples teach me something they teach me that you got to trust the one who has spoken to you and, and they spoke they said we're going to trust this God who's revealed himself in Jesus Christ and we're going to feed them first. Now I could leave you there and take my seat but there's something else the text shares with us and here it is in verse number 12 because he says when the crowd got their fill Jesus says in verse 12 gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. In other words he says now they've gotten what they want now gather up what's left in other words Jesus is saying to them you gave now gather there is a season of giving and then there's a season of gathering there's a season of sowing and then there's a season of reaping I see y'all later I thank you for letting me come by here but now there's somebody who's crying because you're in a season of sowing you're in a season of giving and you don't know how long we're going to be in this pandemonium you don't know how long we're going to be in this pandemic but God told me to tell somebody just keep on giving because gathering season is coming after a while he says gather up the fragments you've given in one season now it's time to gather in this season and the Bible says that as they were gathering, they started gathering and they gathered up one basket. And the Lord said, Keep on gathering. And when they gathered the more, it was two baskets. He said, Keep on gathering. And the more they gathered, three baskets, four baskets, five baskets. But he said, Keep on gathering. And the more they gathered, they started gathering. And as they gathered, six baskets, seven baskets, eight baskets, nine baskets, ten baskets, keep on gathering. Ten baskets became eleven baskets, and eleven baskets became twelve baskets. And God told me to tell you, if you keep on gathering, you'll get more than what you've given. Can I close? You can't be God's giving No matter how you try Just as sure as you are living And the Lord is in heaven on high Can I close like a Baptist? The more you give The more he gives to you Y'all 
excuse me. I've been giving and I've been crying and I've been sitting there saying, God, when is my season going to come? And the Lord told me, just keep on giving and keep on living because it's really true that you can't be God's giving. So I need somebody in here to start gathering. You've been giving, but now gathering. Come on, gathering. Come on, gathering. Come on, gathering. It's right in front of you. Reach out and gather it. Your victory. Reach out and gather it. Your breakthrough. Reach out and grab it. Reach out and gather it. Somebody say, gather it. I'm gathering my joy back. I'm gathering my peace back. I'm gathering my sanity back. I'm gathering my love back. I'm gathering my life back. Come on, somebody say, gather it. I'm gathering it. It's coming my way. Good measure. Sticking together and running over. Somebody say, gather it. Gather it, gather it. Gather it, gather it. Get it back. Get it back. Bring it in. Bring it in. It's coming your way. We shall come rejoicing. Bring it in. The seeds. Come on, bring it in. Come on, bring it in. Come on, bring it in. We shout and grab it. We shout and grab it. It's yours. And what God has for me, it is for me. Come on and grab it. And while you're grabbing it, give God a praise. Grab it and praise it. Grab it and shout about it. Grab it and dance about it. Grab it and give God a shout. Somebody say yeah. Say yeah. Say yeah. Say yeah. Say yeah. I'm getting it. I'm gathering it. It's mine. Yeah. Yeah. disciple pastor had their own basket which means I ain't got to look over on your basket and be jealous of your basket because I got my own basket so I need somebody right now to dance in front of your own basket shout in front of your own basket praise and God over your own basket I got my basket I got my basket I got my basket I ain't sitting there complaining about your basket I got my basket and I'm shouting over my basket I'm praising over my basket I'm dancing about my basket yeah Thank <laughs> you. 
I don't want you, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. I don't want you shouting about what's in your basket and forget about the one who gave you what's in your basket. Listen, there was 12 baskets left. Apostle, I asked the Holy Ghost, shouldn't they have 13 baskets? Because Jesus makes 13. And the Holy Ghost told me to tell you, he doesn't need a basket because he is the basket. He's the bread that never runs out. So come on, I'm not gonna praise him for my basket. I'm gonna praise God because he's the basket giver. He gave me what's in my basket. 